Okay, so let's read it out loud together. Ready? Acts 17, 6 and 7. Those troublemakers who have turned the world upside down have come here to our city. And now Jason and these men have welcomed them as guests. They're traitors to Caesar, teaching that there is another king named Jesus. <laughs> How many believe there's another king named Jesus? How many of you want to be troublemakers that turn the world upside down for the Lord? Well, if that's really true, you're in a bonus season right now because there's never been a time in my life where people needed sense in the midst of confusion than right now, literally right now. There's a mic right there if you want to say it. I trust her. I trust you. Thank you. Serena, we just want to offer our condolences to you oh, with sorry. your dad that's passing. Right. And, uh, you know, how old? 93? And he lived a long, abundant life. And you have Amen. pressed through for his healing. And, and, you know, to the end, you were just there for him and a wonderful daughter. So we just want to keep uh, Serena and her family. In Amen. Life. Thank you, darling. See, that's what two become one. So she can say whatever she wants, whenever she wants. <laughs> All right, you troublemakers, you can sit down. We've read the verse. And I just think... Um, this could probably be one of the best things that you can tell people right now is that they don't have to put their trust in the sinking sand of our culture. You know, that's a reference to Matthew chapter 7 right near the end of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus was speaking to the people. He said, when you hear what I say and then do it, not just hearing, but when you hear what I say and then do it, you'll be like the man who builds his house on what? A rock, because when the storm comes and the winds blow and the waves hit that house, it will not fall because it's built on the rock. But if you hear the words and don't do them, then you'll be like the man who built his house on. And when the storm comes and the wind blow and the rain and the, and the waves hit, that house will fall. And people are really seeing that in the last eight months during COVID, that a lot of the things that they trusted in were not going to stand. The shaking came. And when the shaking came, their house fell. And we want to just say, there's another king named Jesus. <laughs> and I think I have a slide there. Look at that. You guys are good. Thank you, guys. That's, that's the title. And it's a man praying because I've been talking a lot about prayer. And, and, and that's a big place of where this all starts. It's got to start on our daily altar. I have to get down on my knees every morning to remind my flesh, you are not in control, flesh. My spirit is willing, my flesh might be weak, but I'm bringing my flesh underneath the power of Holy Spirit. I'm not going to sow to my flesh, I'm going to sow to my spirit, man. And you all could say the same thing. And we encourage you to get the communion cups online and have them in your house and do that first thing in the morning. Every day when you get up, take communion first. Remind your flesh that it's not in control today. And when you break that little piece of bread, you're saying, my flesh is going to show God's power, not my weakness. In my weakness, his strength will be perfected. Thank you, Paul, for that verse. Amen? So another king named Jesus, and it's a crown, and it's kneeling, and it's submission to him. And in spite of all the weakness that the world would attach to that, it's the greatest place of strength that you can ever be when you're on your knees and you're hearing the voice of the Lord. So that one person in here has to say, I don't hear the voice of the Lord. Would you agree? If you agree, make some noise. I can't read your faces because of these masks. We got to get some invisible face masks or something. I don't know. I, or, you know, transparent. <laughs> I think, you know, we were at a men's breakfast a few years ago, and I went around the table and I said, guys, what makes your wife the happiest? When What's going to make her feel the safest? Because women typically in marriages want to be secure and men want to be respected. Like that's right out of Ephesians chapter 5. And we went all the way around the table, and obviously, you know, things like the bills being paid definitely helps, and, and all, the, all the habitual things we do. And when I did mine, I said, well, this is an easy one. The, the thing that makes my wife the happiest is when she knows that I'm praying and I'm in the Word, because that's where it all starts. And if I'm not praying and I'm not in the Word, she picks up on it. When you marry a prophet, let me tell you, it's really good, but you can't hide anything. And that's a good thing. Right? That's a good thing. Because so she could tell if my attitude was a little agitated, if I wasn't really hearing from the Lord. And what a valuable thing that is to have in your life. A person who will just speak honestly to you. And 
And it's not a hard thing to hear from the Lord because if it was a hard thing, he wouldn't be a good father. But if you're a good father, you want to talk to your children and you want them to talk to you. So you're not going to be a distant God. And people will say, well, I don't know. I've tried it and I've prayed. And, and I don't have a, a quick formula answer for you other than to say, keep trying. Because he will make yourself, himself real to you if you'll just keep listening. And, and like I said, it's, uh, I, I've quoted it often. Heidi Baker is married to a man named Roland Baker. And his grandfather was a famous missionary in China way back in the days when missions was not a common thing. And he was working with an orphanage in China where the kids were escaping the coal mines, dying at 9 and 10 years old. And their only hope to live was to escape. And they would find their way to the to the missionary uh, uh, outpost that he had. And the, the Lord showed up miraculously. I, I believe it's called Visions Behind the Veil. And the last name is Baker. I don't remember his first name. Somebody might know here. Uh, Rollin is the son. I don't remember the grandfather's name. Um, but it's, it's an amazing book because they took the children. They didn't really believe him at first that the Lord had appeared to all of them. And they brought them into separate rooms and asked them the same questions. And none of these children had any education at all. They told the exact same story. And there was a revival in that little mission house. So if God will show up to these little children that were dying in the coal mines of China, he'll show up to you. And that's what the grandfather said to Rowan that he never forgot. was that, that verse from Matthew 25. In that you do it to the least of these, my brethren. You do it what? You do it unto the Lord. So when you're looking at another human being, you're looking into the face of divinity in there somewhere. They're made in the image of God. And that's what the grandfather said. Nowhere on earth, I couldn't imagine there's any more least than these. And the Lord showed up. So look, that's a good thing, isn't it? Isn't that good news? That he's not a distant God, angry. You don't have to keep trying to appease him with your offerings and killing some sacrifice. That you could just come to him as a father and say, Abba, I need to hear your voice today. So that's what it's been about. A couple of weeks ago, I did My Faith Will Not Fail. This is when the Lord spoke to Peter. And he said, you're going to fail me, but your faith is not going to fail because I'm going to pray for you. Remember? He predicted that Peter would, would deny him three times. And Peter did, even though Peter said, no, I won't. And he said, it's okay, it's okay, I'm going to pray for you. And when you come back, you're going to strengthen your brothers. I can relate, can you? And then there's this awesome verse of 1 John 3.20 that says, when our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. So we don't have to live in that shame of making mistakes and the regret. And that's a part of being a Christian. He's, God is close to those with a broken spirit and a contrite heart. It's okay to come to the Lord and say, I'm sorry I let you down. I know the way I behaved yesterday is not the way I want to be. Will you help me? That's a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Because you recognize you can't do it in your own strength. Then last week it was the prayer journey from knowing to growing. Luke 18.1 talks, starts the parable about the persistent widow. Remember this one? And she goes to the judge and she's relentless. And he ignores her at first. And Jesus says, listen... If the unjust judge will, will eventually give the widow what you want, how much more will your Father in heaven when you keep on praying? How much more? God is not the unjust judge. You know that, right? He's a loving Father. And maybe you've had prayers that haven't been answered, but I'm saying just be like that persistent widow. Keep on bringing that need to the Lord. Keep on saying, while I'm waiting, I'm going to prosper while I'm waiting to get the answer to that prayer. I'm not letting the devil steal my joy. That's where my strength comes from. And then I already told you. So I'm just going to unpack Acts 17 a little bit where we started. Remember what it said? These troublemakers come. They have a political insurrection. They want to overthrow Caesar's government. And, you know, we know from Ephesians that we're supposed to put on the whole armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Come on, you know it. But against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. So we're, we're told throughout the New Testament that there's a lot more going on than just the natural realm, that there's a spiritual war going on too. And boy, if that hasn't been evident in the last nine months, where have you been? Because it's so evident when, when fear is hijacking somebody, that's a spiritual attack. And don't give them that ground. Don't give them the peace of your heart. My peace I give you, Jesus said. My peace I give you. Don't let the devil rob 
that peace from you. And that doesn't mean that there aren't scary things happening. It means he's given us the equipping and the tools to know how to deal with it. And he stays as my king. He stays enthroned, on the throne of my heart, not the world, not the sinking sand. So this says in the voice, there were riots going on in Thessalonica. And in verse 5, it says, seeing this movement was growing, the Christians were starting to grow. They were attracting a lot of people. I wonder why. Because they had good news. And because they were full of the Holy Spirit. And the people that saw them knew them before they were Christians and now see them after. And they're like, what happened to you? Something's different about you. I got saved. And I'm glowing with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's the best evangelism that there is. Let them see the change in your life. Pray for them and they'll get healed. They'll believe God's real because he is. So they saw the movement grow. And these are the enemies of the early church. And the unconvinced Jewish people became protective and angry. What were they trying to protect? Their principalities and their powers, right? That's that spirit that's in operation. And whatever the entrenched principality is, it doesn't want to give ground to the kingdom of God. So what if you're in a business and there's some, uh, I don't know, shady business going on? Anybody have shady business going on in your company? Not by you, of course, but something that you might see. And you're not always sure how to attack that kind of thing, are you? Well, prayer's a good way to start and say, Lord, just show me what the strategy is because I don't want to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, but this is where you have me right now. So instead of me being impacted negatively by them, let me be a positive impact on them. And expose, like Trisha said, expose the corruption so that it gets uncovered. God, God loves that prayer. He's a God of justice. He wants to see it exposed. So this principality in Thessalonica was not happy that the Christians were here, and they take it out on, on this guy, Jason. They found, this version says, some ruffians hanging out in the marketplace and convinced them to start a riot. Selah. <laughs> Been some riots in America for the last few months, right? Some people getting paid to go riot. <laughs> Amazing. So they found some ruffians in the, in the marketplace and convinced them to start a riot. And soon a mob formed and the whole city was seething with tension. Sounds a lot like America today, doesn't it? Seething with tension. The mob was going street by street looking for Paul and Silas, who are the leaders of this new troublemaking band that was turning the world upside down. But they were nowhere to be found. Frustrated, the mob came to the house of Jason, who was now known as a believer. Jason was now known as a man who had a different king, and the king's name was Jesus. Wouldn't that be a great way for people to know you on your job? Like how the unsaved people would look at you and say, well, I don't know about her, man. She's operating from a different kingdom. She's got a different king named Jesus. And, and she claims that Jesus gave her his spirit to live on the inside. Sounds pretty good to me. I don't want to depend on my spirit. I know where that takes me, what ditch I ended up in with that person driving the wheel, steering it. Uh-uh. I want you, Lord. I want you on that throne. So they grabbed this guy, Jason, and some of the believers, and they found, they dragged him out to the city officials and said, these people are political agitators. <laughs> so how do you think that fits into the culture of America right now where churches aren't supposed to talk about politics? Right? Like, this is, this is the exact charge that was being brought against the early church is that they don't want to submit to the heathen rules. And we're saying the same thing. We're not going to submit to the heathen rules, no matter who's in the Supreme Court, no matter who's in the White House or who's in the Senate. You have to have a line that you draw and say, no, I'm not crossing that line. Do with me whatever you have to do. Take away the tax-exempt status if you have to. I don't care. I don't think the Apostle Paul cared about losing the tax-exempt status in the book of Acts. He would not even know what the heck we're talking about. And the irony is the church has flourished through persecution. And we're not suffering persecution the way some people are in different parts of the world, right? So let's just keep that in perspective and recognize not this as a, a horrible time, but as an amazing opportunity to talk to people. And if what you have is as good as you think it is, you should be able to convince them that they should try a different way to live that there's another king, and his name is Jesus. You don't have to follow the political system or the ways of the world or all of the, I would just say, the, the different philosophies that are trying to normalize sin. That's what the world is trying to do. That's what the devil has always tried to do. They don't want boundaries. Anything goes to the point of such ludicrous statements that are being made that there's no biological difference between a man and a woman. 
And your taxes are going to pay children that curriculum in a school. They could just pick whatever they want to be, boy or girl. I mean, they're just completely, blatantly violating science and saying that science isn't even true anymore because this is how much the heathen are raging. You know, from Psalm 2, right? Verse 1. Why do the heathen rage? Why do they plot a vain thing? The vain thing is thinking you can live without God. How many times do you have to make the same mistake over and over? And they keep falling into the same trap. Well, I'll just live together with her for a while to see if it's a good match. It doesn't matter to them that all the statistics from the unsafe psychologists are saying there's a higher failure rate if you live with somebody before you marry them. They don't care why. Because pride rises up and says, well, that might be everybody else, but not me. Oh, man, pride comes before the stumble and the fall. There's a reason these rules make sense. Marriage is sacred. It's a holy thing between a man and a woman. Why is this controversial? <laughs> oh, my God, it's amazing, isn't it? But the culture wants to normalize sin. It's, oh, no, no, that's your, that's your truth. That's old. Well, it is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And if you don't believe that, well, we'll try to convince you otherwise. God is in control. He tells us these things for our protection because he's a good father and he loves us. And, and Paul said, you know, if you join yourself to someone else in, the act, in a sexual act, you become in one with that person. And you don't want to do that unless that person has committed their life to you and to the Lord and say, you know what? It, it could get a little rough during the ride here, but I'm with you until death do us part. I'm not leaving. Divorce is not an option. We're going to stay in this thing together. I go, that could sound a little harsh, I know, but... I'm just telling you, that's a great way to look at it. Trisha and I have followed that path for 35 years, and she hung in there with me. <laughs> I think they asked, uh, who has a Billy Graham's wife, have you ever considered divorce? And she said, divorce, no. Murder, yes. <laughs> I think Trish could probably say amen to that. <laughs> Verse 7 in Acts 17, and the voice says, They've come here to our fine city, and this man Jason has let them stay in his house and given them sanctuary, and he get, made it a base of their operations. You know what a base of operations is called? A church. <laughs> that's, where, that's what God's people gather and congregate and get filled with his spirit, get prayed for, get encouraged. We hear testimonies from other people, and we live life together. We don't forsake the assembly together with other believers, because that's a spiritual principle, too, that we strengthen each other. One week you come, and you're praying for somebody else, and next week you're coming back, and you need the prayer. And no strings attached, just because of God has been so good to us. Amen? And then in, in Proverbs 14, it says there's a way that appears to be right, but in the end, what? It leads to death. And in those days, Judges 21, 25, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Sound like America? Yeah. yeah. Everyone did as they saw fit because they didn't have a king. And they don't want to follow the rules of the Lord. Too bad. You know, that should, that should cultivate uh, empathy in our hearts for people. It says that Jesus looked at the crowds, and they were hurting. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. One version says, harassed and helpless. And, and, and look, they, they come across very good in the, in the way they express their opinions, but the Holy Spirit will give you the clues that are needed to speak to unsafe people and, and to let him use your mouth as a way to speak to them, right? A conduit between heaven and earth as soon as you stop hating them <laughs> and, and, and see them like Jesus did as sheep without a shepherd, harassed and hurting. And Psalm 14 says, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. I don't want to be a fool. How about you? I'm convinced there is a God. And I've learned that the hard way. And I want to help other people find that too. And I hope partly through the example. I mean, I work on Wall Street. A lot of you know that. I've, I've had the privilege of being able to influence a lot of people on Wall Street for the Lord who were not believers. And I'm part of a group of other believers on Wall Street that are really having an, an amazing impact on people that tend to, you know, look at the things of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, as Jesus said. That's another God, mammon. But you can't serve God and mammon, Jesus said, right? But even there, like you might say, in the beast of the belly, people are getting saved. Because it's really good news. 
And there's a power to it that cannot be denied, and people recognize that. Anyway, uh, Psalm 2, I already quoted it. Why do the heathen rage and they plot a vain thing? And it's just not a new story. There's nothing new under the sun. People don't want God telling them how they're supposed to live their lives because they don't see him as a loving father who's got their best in store for them. Uh, you got a couple minutes left here? All right. So sec I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 2. Again, I'm using the voice. I like that translation. It says in verse 14, a person who denies spiritual realities. All right, stop there for a second and think about the difference between the spirit and the flesh. There's natural laws and then there's spiritual laws, right? Sowing and reaping. If you sow the wind, what do you reap? The whirlwind. So that's a law of increase in the spirit. If you sow a blessing, you get a bigger blessing back. If you sow a curse, you get Solomon with 700 porcupines. Right? King David never dealt with his sexual issues. He had problems. Transferred down the line. Took the whole country down for a while. It's an oversimplification of the story, but you got to deal with your stuff. We interviewed Robin Vincent, and she said, you got a deal to heal. <laughs> that was her grandma. It's good wisdom. So, look, here's where the empathy has to come in, because it says here, a person who denies the spiritual realities will not accept the things that come through the Spirit of God. So you're saying you shouldn't live together before you get married. You should just really date and, and, and go on a courtship period and, and make a decision. Is this the one? Have you heard from the Lord? And if it is the one that you get married, oh, no, I'm just going to try it out for a while. Take it out for a test drive. I'll call the tow truck for you because you're going to end up in the ditch. Spiritual reality, earthly reality. Spiritual reality is gravity. So you would sit there and look at this plane that might weigh, I don't know how many tons of plane, a jet plane weighs, and the law of gravity is holding it down. But what happens? It starts taxiing down the runway. And instead of the law of gravity holding it down, another law kicks in. And it's called the law of lift. That if I can get going fast enough, and I got the wings at the right angle, boom. Doesn't mean gravity's not still there, but Christians have the law of lift called the Spirit of God, to take you out of the mess. But you better understand the spiritual realities of that, too. Because gravity is a very strong pull, isn't it? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. And that starts now, as a Christian, you start to experience the eternal life. Because you have a, a deposit, a down payment of Holy Spirit in us now that's showing us what it's going to be like for eternity with the Lord. Is it easy? No, it's not, right? I mean, I, we were with friends uh, on the phone uh, on, the, on the interview, and, and we were in, introduced as people who have a church in the hard ground of the Northeast. <laughs> you know, it's hard ground up there. They were from the South. Well, like in the South, more people are at least will acknowledge that they're Christians as, as opposed to actually living it, but at least they say they are. And... People from around the country look at us and say, wow, that's, that's hard ground. You guys aren't hard ground. You're awesome. We love you. But, you know, New York is. People can seem a little rude around here because they just get up in your grill. And they're like, you know, like you know where they stand. It's okay. We got a good thing we're offering them in, in Jesus. You could just be honest and tell them. I love that about this part of the world. So, look, they can't accept the things, and it sounds like foolishness to them. But... This is really like a very deep concept. He says, that person that you're talking to is incapable of grasping that spiritual law because those spiritual laws are disseminated and discerned and valued by the Holy Spirit. So they're still tuning in to the wrong satellite, right? They've got their dish pointed in the wrong direction, so it might look like foolishness to you, but the other spiritual law is the law of attraction. And they'll see something about you as a Christian that you're not dealing with the same problems they're dealing with. And how come you handle things differently? And how come you're kinder when somebody makes a mistake in the office and yet that other person seems to, to receive it from you a little different? And it's on display on a regular basis, isn't it? And if you're a legalistic Christian, then it's going to backfire because you look very judgmental to the people that, that work around here. But if you're walking in kindness and you're standing firm in the truth, but still, like Jesus said it, the Bible says it so well, speak the truth, but do it in love. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. 
They're not cliches. These are difficult things to do, aren't they? <laughs> Prayer is the key. You want Jesus as your king? Yes, say yes. Prayer is where it's got to start, right here. Strongest position you're ever going to be in is right here. Lord, I need you. Give me direction today. I want the download of the latest GPS software from heaven. I don't want yesterday's version. I need the latest version for today because today's different than yesterday. I don't want yesterday's bread. Give me the daily bread that I need. Now to the message. 2 Corinthians 5, one man died for everyone, and that puts everyone in the same ship, <laughs> right? So my wife was saved before I was, and when we met, you know, and she said, well, look, just because I've been saved longer doesn't mean that the Lord doesn't want to talk to you too. It was only a couple years. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge thing. And, and I would say, wow, man, I'm just so impressed at, you know, how you know the Bible. And so she said, don't worry, you, you know, you'll get it. it it'll, you'll, you'll pick up on it fast because the Lord doesn't have favorites Everybody's his favorite. If you're willing to do it, he rewards the diligent seeker. You're the diligent seeker. You'll operate in an anointing in your world that I could never do, and you might not ever want to come to Wall Street. Two different places, right? But that's a good thing because we're like custom ambassadors for whoever we live with. And if you got Thanksgiving dinner with some people that might not have been too happy to see you, you know what I'm talking about. But you pray before you go. And so, Lord, I want to reflect your character, not my carnal nature, your character. Everybody's in the same ship. Leadership. <laughs> Who's your kingship? Who's your lordship? What about your relationship? Is with the Lord. And that, and that just flows down to everybody else. Hmm, puts us all in the same ship. He included everyone in his death, so everyone could also be included in his life. A, a resurrection life, a far better life than people ever lived on their own. Anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start and is created anew. Thank you, Lord. The old life is gone. A new life beckons, giving the world a fresh start by offering the forgiveness of sins. I couldn't save myself, but I came to Jesus, and he forgave my sins. Now, here's our part. I see Joe up in the back. You're looking good, man, like a Santa Claus mask you got going on. You just need the, uh, the hat going. This is an important verse. It's in Isaiah 62, 6 and 7, in, in the Passion, it says, Jerusalem, I have stationed intercessors on your walls who will never be silent day or night. How many want to be in that category, in that group, that remnant people that are never going to stop praying? That's a fire burning on the inside. That's not getting discouraged. That's saying, I know what it looks like, but I also know Jeremiah 29, 11, And I know the thoughts and plans that he has for me. Plans to prosper me. They're good to give me peace, not to give me a riot in the streets. <laughs> they will take no rest. Don't you love that? Not everybody's giving me an amen on that one. They're going to take no rest, and they will tirelessly give God no rest. <laughs> until he firmly has established Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. Now, we could just convey that to the Christian kingdom in the earth, right? They're going to keep on praying, Lord, we need your kingship. They need to know there's another king, and his name is Jesus. It's not Caesar. It's in God that we trust. Still on the dollar bill last time I checked, anyway. <laughs> until he firmly has established Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. And then I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up now, but it says in, in Acts 14, 22, look at this. Is, here's the spiritual warfare piece right now. And it's not like they didn't warn us. It's not like the writers of the New Testament didn't warn us. It says, it's necessary for us to enter into the realm of God's kingdom because that's the only way that we will endure the many trials and persecutions of being an ambassador for the king. This is a radical message that we're bringing. And can I just comment? on America right now, I think a big part of the problem is that the churches have just been too decaffeinated and just been too ready to just water down the power of the word and say, oh, no, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. That's normalizing sin. And God's not happy about normalizing sin. You know, we were forgiven of our sins, but he told the woman caught in adultery, go sin no more. Oh, she might have said, I feel so judged. Well, then go ahead and keep sinning. Watch what happens. It's a disaster. I have good news for you. But you need to now be a diligent seeker of the Lord, and he will help you. 
He will empower you so that you won't give in to that sin nature. Last portion. I'm in 1 Samuel now. And you guys probably remember this. If you studied the life of David at all, 1 Samuel 12 is before David comes on the scene, but it's the beginning of King Saul's reign, and that did not go well, right? You all know that. We could look at King Saul in the Old Testament as, a, as the master of our flesh. He didn't pray. When he wasn't sure what to do, he went and visited a witch. And this is after being told that he was the anointed of God. Was he the anointed of God? Yes. Did he act like it? No. But God has a big, long set of patience with us. You know, he really wants it to work. He didn't really want them to have a king, though. But he still made a way out. And that's how you could look at family members or other people who aren't Christians. It should break our hearts that they don't know the Lord. Because they're missing out on the best thing. And that, we, that one decision to get saved would change so many decisions that they make in their lives, right? And it's easy to, remember, to, to forget what it was like if you've been saved a long time. So this is what it says in verse 14 of 1 Samuel 12. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice, and if you don't rebel against the command of the Lord, all right, this is after they decided that they wanted a king. We want to be like the other nations. We want a king. He says, all right, listen, I'll, God's going to do it. And, and here's the condition, that you have to fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice. And if you do not rebel against the command of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord, then all will be well. It's a lot of ifs. If you're a computer programmer, you know about the if statements. The if and the then, right? Well, okay, so there's a narrow road that leads to life here. If you want to have this king, you can do it. But it's under these conditions. Fear the Lord. Serve him. Obey his voice. Don't rebel against him. If you and your king follow the Lord, then all will be well. But, verse 15, if you disobey the Lord and rebel against his command, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Verse 16, now therefore stand and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the wheat harvest today? Now, they're in an agricultural culture, right? So the wheat harvest is something they've been waiting for. They put a lot of work into putting those seeds in the ground and waiting for it to grow and keeping the pests away. And now it says, yeah, I will call on the Lord to send thunder and rain so that you'll know and see what a great evil you've committed in the sight of the Lord by asking for a king. All right, so this is Samuel now. And you might say, well, gee, God's not angry anymore. No, he's not. But when you disobey him, you take yourself out from underneath the protection of the blessing. Because the blessing comes in obedience. And that's why we can't water down the truth of the gospel. And say, well, you know, if you love each other, it's no big deal. Oh, no, you better make a commitment. You better make a covenant commitment. It's a really big deal. Oh, I could go off on that tangent, and I won't. But they would understand the, the analogy here because when, when the law was given... There was thunder and lightning on that mountain, and they didn't want to touch that mountain back in Exodus, right? Chapter 19, they heard the sound, trumpets blowing, thunder, lightning. Like, they knew they were too afraid. They said, Moses, you go for us, because we can't. We'll die if we go there. And now the same thing happens here. He calls on the Lord. So verse 18, Samuel called on the Lord, and on that day the Lord sent thunder and rain. And as a result, the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel, and they pleaded with him, pray to the Lord your God for your servants so that we will not die. We need to pray for America, that we won't be judged by God for abortion. We could just stop right there. Never mind many, many other ways that, that we have violated the covenant that God said, if you, want to be, if you want to be blessed, you need to be obedient to me. And look, it says it right in the dollar bill, in God we trust. And we just have to watch the spiritual warfare that would start to drift us away from those things. And you could find it pretty easily if you're looking for it, that God would say, uh, yeah, there is a difference, a biological difference between a man and a woman. <laughs> that should be Evident to anybody with two eyes, you should see that there's a biological difference, right? So when the very foundations of family and structure is being attacked, you know that's a spiritual attack. Because if you can confuse people about their identity, then you can rule them much more easily. That's an understanding of spiritual warfare. They don't know who they are. So that we will not die, for you have added to all the sins the, uh, 
the evil, we, they were saying, we've added to all the other sins the evil of asking for a king because we didn't trust you to be our king. And then Samuel says this great thing, which is what we as a church should be saying, don't be afraid. Even though you've committed all this evil, don't turn aside from following the Lord. You can say that to people. It's true. We all make bad decisions. There's forgiveness. There's redemption. You've turned aside from following the Lord, but don't do that now. Serve the Lord with part of your heart. <laughs> yeah, it's good that you can see that one. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not so easy, is it? Cindy Jacobs said the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. <laughs> I want to sacrifice everything to you, Lord, but let me go do this first. And then forgive me when I come back and repent. 21, this is real powerful. 1 Samuel 12, 21. Don't turn aside after worthless things that cannot profit you or deliver you, for they are empty. Can you think of anything? Video games? <laughs> you think I'm talking to kids? Well, I see adults when I used to ride the subway all the way back in February since I've been in New York City. But, I mean, people were just rude. They would ignore everything around them. They were so lost in the video game. These are adults. Like, it's, it's really addictive, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm stepping on somebody's toes. I better back off. Sports? Think guys can become addicted to sports? Oh, man, you're reading the sports page more than the Bible, and you're saying Jesus is your king? How far should I go on these examples? Not too far. You get the point. There's never been a day when there's been more things competing for your attention that are right in your pocket in this supercomputer called a phone. But what does he reward? The diligent seeker after him. I'm going to love him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then, verse 23, oh, well, I guess I, I didn't read 22 yet. Indeed, for the sake of his great name, the Lord will not abandon his people. That's worth saying again, isn't it? For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not abandon his people because he's pleased to make you his own. Even if you've made mistakes, it's okay. There's mercy. As for me, I love this. This is so convicting, though. Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Say amen or ouch. <laughs> Nobody said ouch? I said ouch. Oh, it's a sin not to pray? Yep, there it is. The prayer of sinlessness is spelled out right there. And, and look, here's the thing. I was one of those people, and I've said it enough times, you know that my wife modeled something very different for me about a prayer life that, that I found very appealing because it was a relationship with the Lord. It wasn't a list of things. And, in my logical brain, that's how everything worked. Okay, I got to pray first, 10 minutes. I don't know, can I afford 10 minutes? That's a bad idea. When you understand God is a loving father, he's in relationship with you. You bring him into every situation throughout the day. This is why it says in the Bible, pray at all times. It's not excluding other things. It's just keeping him in the conversation in everything you do and not thinking anything you do doesn't matter to him. It all matters to him. And he's big enough to sort us all out. <laughs> and then he said in verse 23, and I will continue to teach you the good way and the right way. This is what the church is here for, all right? Now, we don't have all the best qualifications, but we have Jesus. And we have Holy Spirit. And we have the Word of God. And part of the thing that the world loves about Christians that, that are authentic is that even though they're not perfect, they keep trying to follow the Lord. We're not having to have perfect performance in order for people to say, whatever it is you have, I don't know what it is, but I want it. That's the greatest witness, isn't it? And it's not because you're perfect. It's great to memorize scripture, you know, but don't become a legalist. Reflect a relationship, a live relationship with a living God. That's the greatest thing we can do. Come on, let's stand, okay? I just want to pray for you guys and anybody who's watching. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I mean, I was saying to Serena when we went to her mother's funeral, uh, her mother was attending a Catholic church up in near Marstown. And, and the Catholic priest that was overseeing the service, tell me his name again. Father Jude. Father Jude. I'll never forget the thing he said from the altar in the Catholic church because I guess he knew that 
not everybody in the room that was there from the family was Catholic. And he said, I just want to apologize to you all. It's Catholic priest speaking now. If there was any way that the Catholic Church ever hurt you and never properly represented Father God as a loving father, if we ever projected him as an angry God, would you forgive us? I was looking at like, what? I never heard that before. This guy's saved. Because he is. Right. So look, you don't argue with it. It's amazing. The Lord will touch anybody. My mother got saved in a charismatic Catholic service. So I got to thank God that she was there that day. Amen? So that's how I got saved. So let's stop judging people. Let's just say, Lord, I don't want to commit the sin of prayerlessness. I want to be a force for good for the kingdom of God. And it's not easy. It's way easier to just take the bumper stickers and just join tribes. Now he's saying, look, I want you to be a force in the culture. I want you to be like the ones that are turning the world upside down. These radical agitators are saying there's another king. Are you? Yes, I am. I'm guilty. I'm saying there's another king. His name is Jesus, regardless of who the president is. Amen? <laughs> all right, here he goes. I'm going to finish. It says, above all, fear the Lord. Serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things that he's done for you. But if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. <laughs> uh, anybody that wants these slides, I'll send them to you, man, because the Lord was just sharper than a two-edged sword. And it's really good to remind ourselves. So would you lift your hands? So, Lord, we just want to be these people that are going to be those ambassadors that will reflect your nature, not, not hating people, not using foul language, not, not disagreeing to the point where we're, we're looking like we hate the sinner. We might hate the sin, but we don't want to look like we hate the sinner, Lord, because we recognize if you're truly the king, we're spending a lot of time speaking to you, and that means you're spending a lot of time speaking to us. And we just want to have that ear open at all times. You wouldn't tell us to pray at all times if it wasn't possible to do it. So we just ask you to soften any stony part of our heart from the last eight months of COVID and the election cycle that we've been through and, and just the agitation people are experiencing right now. We say soften that with your oil. Come in and touch our hearts and, and bring that healing of Holy Spirit that the joy would return and that we would not be victims of what the culture's trying to do, but we would actually shift the culture by the power of God operating inside of us. And we just pray it, Lord, not through our power, not by our might, but by your power working through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's a good goal. And Trisha said this last week, I'm just going to say it because we don't know everybody who's here or us or don't. If you don't know the Lord, it's a really easy decision to just ask him to come into your heart. So you could just say a quick prayer with us. Church, can we pray it together? All right, so let's just say it this way. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I heard good news today that you're not an angry God, but that you're a loving Father. I want to do what I heard. I want to obey you but I need your help. I bow my knee to your Lordship, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior today. I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit, with your power, that I might be empowered to serve you all the days of my life and for eternity, in Jesus' name. Pray, church, okay? Just pray that that seed, that that, that prayer would just be landing in somebody's heart right now and that it would take root and not be plucked away, but take root. Some people are watching online. If you said that prayer, please reach out to us. You can find us on the website. We're getting so many prayer requests right now. Please join in that group of people. We've got a lot of people praying here for you guys. And if you're here in the building and you said that prayer and you accepted the Lord, please come up to the front. We would love to know that you made that decision today. Welcome you into the family. Give you a Bible and introduce you to the king that we know. So Lord, I bless your people as they go today. I thank you for their faith for coming out. And I just want to let my wife share one thing. Yeah, so if uh, I just want to pray for anyone battling with any spirit of infirmity. Um, you don't necessarily have to be sick, but feeling weak, you know, and oppressed maybe. I'm, I'm going to just pray because uh, there's a lot going on, but, um, you know, God wants to strengthen us. So anybody feeling like battling with any kind of infirmity or 
All right, and um, yeah, so we'll, we'll pray, and we're going to lift you up right now, okay? So, Lord, we just thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord God, that you are in control, and you are the one seated on the throne, oh God. And, Father, we just, first of all, I just want to pray what's in the atmosphere out and about. And so, Lord, all that spirit of confusion and, and uh, chaos, uh, the spirit of witchcraft, Father, Jezebelic spirit, we bind you and render you ineffective and powerless in Jesus' name. Lord, we just say that that will not influence us. And the Lord wants us to, I just hear the Lord saying, whose voice are you listening to? We just need to silence the voice. Even, of, uh, you know, we've said it here many times, fake news of media, of, of a lot of unfortunate, uh, it's propaganda. And so uh, just watch what you're listening to because that will that'll cause infirmity in your spirit, in your, in your spirit man. So, Lord, we just, we just take authority over even just any kind of defilement from just all the, you know, confusion and all the words going because it does affect our spirit. Yeah. And so, Lord, we just, we just pray a cleansing. And, Father, I just ask that you, you just strengthen all of us. Terry said it. You know, you encourage yourself in the Lord. And so, Father, I just bind up all sickness, all infirmity, Father, we just take authority over just weariness that has come upon your people, Lord, and we lose the strength of God. We lose the joy of the Lord. Father, we just thank you for a hunger and a thirst for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for praying and for the opportunity to get in your presence because it's like a, it's a spiritual drug that, that's free that lifts you up. So, and if you don't know how to pray, just start talking like yeah. you would to your friend. It's, it's very simple. And so the Lord meets us right where we're at. Amen. So, Lord, I just thank you for a strengthening. We thank you for a peace that passes all understanding. One of your names, O oh God, is Jehovah Shalom. You are the God of all peace that crushes Satan's head under our feet. So, Lord, we just thank you for breakthrough. In Jesus' name, we just release the blessing of the Lord over each and every one here. And that the joy of the Lord is your strength. You are more than conquerors. Don't come leave here as a victim. Know that you are a victor in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>